Good morning again. Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let's bow our heads this morning for just a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to you, to spend time with you, to learn of your will for us. Be with us this morning as we open your word. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Before I begin, I'm, Todd was right, I am going to talk about him. Um, only because he's here. I wouldn't do it if he wasn't here. I wouldn't do it behind your back. Um, I appreciate that Todd's able to be here and sing this morning. Um, um, Todd works for Brother Doug Batchelor in his ministry. Um, we went to uh, high school at Highland Academy together, room for four years together at Southern. It was Todd who told me I should ask out that really cute girl to his left. And so Todd is a very dear friend of ours and I would be remiss if I didn't give him a, a very kind introduction. So it's good to have you with us this morning, Todd, um, and uh, have the opportunity to worship with you this morning. We're all familiar with Sister White's statement where she says, prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. Amen. We believe as a church in prayer, amen? amen? Now, unfortunately, prayer gets used all too often when we have a problem. But prayer is intended to be a communication between us and heaven. This is how we communicate with heaven, and we need to listen for God to speak to us as well. So this morning, I thought it might be beneficial to take just a moment to talk a little bit about prayer. You know, throughout our lives, I know I have in mine and I'm assuming you have in yours, we've all seen God answer prayers. Prayers for healing, for restoration, for God's direct intervention in our lives when we've had a catastrophic event. But then there are those times when we seek answers to prayers and we aren't confident that God is hearing us. We're not confident we're getting clear direction from God. How do we pray during those times? What do we do when we don't hear God give us clear answers to our prayers. You know, it's encouraging to read scripture because we receive in scripture countless examples of God intervening directly in the lives of his followers. Wouldn't it be nice to have the kind of relationship that Moses had with God? You know, Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt into the wilderness. And everywhere the Israelites went, they encountered problems, obstacles, food and water shortages, vipers, enemies, outright rebellion in the camp. But as the need arose, arose God answered the prayers of his people. I think of Hezekiah and his prayer of deliverance from the Assyrians. Elijah on Mount Carmel. As he prayed for God to rain fire down from heaven in the sight of the multitude. You know, there's times when I think if truth be told, we would have liked to have had that kind of relationship with God where we could rain down fire. Then there are the prayers of Gideon as he spread out the fleece. Hannah's prayer of thanksgiving for answered 
prayer after the birth of Samuel, Solomon's prayer for wisdom, and Christ teaching the disciples how to pray. In his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, there are many, many examples of answered prayer. And we as a church believe there's power in prayer. But what do we do when we don't find we're getting the answers we feel we need in prayer? Let's be honest. Most of us will never have to lead a million people across the desert. We won't be faced with annihilation by advancing armies or need to call fire down from heaven. But there are times when we need the guidance that only comes from God. And we need wisdom that only God can give. So we continue to pray. But should we continue to bring the same requests over and over and over to God? In Luke 11, 5 through 8, Christ shares a powerful illustration of prayer. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as much as he needeth. How many times should I pray for something? I believe we find the answer in this text. Let's review the text in a little more detail. An unexpected guest comes at midnight. The custom at the time, and still today in many Middle Eastern countries, requires that the guest be served something to eat. Bread is served with nearly every meal, so this is the logical food to serve. Bread is referred to in the Middle East as the gift of God. But the cupboard was bare, and being midnight with no stores open, the homeowner went to his neighbor for bread, but he finds his neighbor in bed, and his neighbor doesn't want to get up and give him what he needs. You know, it's easy to sympathize with the neighbor. At the time, when you went to bed, everyone went to bed. And because the country was generally not well managed from a law enforcement standpoint, you would bring all of your animals into the house with you. Everyone and everything is inside, asleep. Of course, it's dark, there's no street lights, no night lights that you can rely on. The fire may have gone out in the fireplace. There's no flashlights, no electricity. And to make a, a, a light of some sort would have required effort. Have you ever tried to light something using a flint? So first you have to find the flint in the dark. Then you have to find the candle in the dark. Then you have to light the candle with the flint and the rock. So some considerable effort. And it's never pleasant to have to get out of bed once you're in. Getting up would no doubt have disturbed the children and the pets. And so he didn't want to get up. I kind of understand that. But the friend continues to knock. And Jesus says his friend finally got up, not because his friend was at the door, but because his friend wouldn't quit knocking until he got what he wanted. Christ then says plainly in verse nine, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now Christ is not suggesting in the parable that God is a reluctant neighbor. The message of the parable is be persistent. We make a lot of requests from God. But before our requests can become real prayers, 
We must, even as the friend at midnight, come in a spirit of urgent need. We must remember that heaven hears what we are determined it will hear. God is not a trifler. He's completely in earnest. God wants this little sin problem over with. He wants us to be serious about our prayer life and the requests we bring to him. And often he does not answer us until we become tireless in our determination. So how many times should I pray for something? Christ's Object Lessons, page 145. Often he, Christ, delays to answer us in order to try our faith or test the genuineness of our desires. Having asked according to his word, we should believe his promise and press our petitions with a determination that will not be denied. Note there are three qualifiers here. First, we must ask according to his word, not according to our desires. Second, we must believe his promise. And third, we must press our petitions with a determination that will not be denied. Remember how Jacob wrestled with the angel. You remember the story? Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. How Jesus instructed his disciples, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Tarry until, wait until. Paul found it necessary to pray three times before he found the grace sufficient for the thorn in the flesh. Elijah prayed seven times before the rain came. And speaking of the believers, Paul says, without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Does God know what we need? Of course he does. So why keep asking God for something when he already knows what we need? The problem is God does know what we need. But in many cases, we don't. We may not be asking for what is best for us. We believe we know what we need, and so our requests fit that reasoning. But many times, the things we ask for are not in our best interest. Think back over the years. Can you recall a prayer you prayed that God answered in an unexpected way? <laughs> Certainly in a way you weren't prepared for. I can. I've learned that sometimes God's answer is no or wait. There are a number of times when if God had answered my prayer in the way that I wanted him to, my life right now would be a total wreck. I didn't see it at the time. I see it very clearly now. We have to learn to trust God we have to learn to trust that he knows what he's doing. And we need to ask him to answer our prayers in the way that he deems best. I think we've all had situations in our lives where we pray for something and God sees fit not to give us what we ask for. It's worth noting that in Luke 11:8, Christ says that the neighbor gave him as many as he needed. It doesn't say he gave him as many as he wanted. And so it is with God, he gives us what we need. I may think I need a better paying job when what I need to learn is stewardship. Someone else may think they need a break from a pushy relative when what they need is grace to endure. I'd like a Cadillac. But what I need is something far less. It would be nice to know the end from the beginning, but that's not for us to know. The second best thing would be to know someone that does know the end from the beginning. And we're very fortunate that we know who that is. God can direct us 
from the beginning to the end. We are told by the pen of inspiration and ministry of healing, page 479, that God, and this is a very common saying, we've all heard it, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. And so as we pray, as we wait for answers, we learn to trust that God knows what is best for us and he gives us what we need as we need it. In Luke 18, verse 1, Christ tells us that men ought always to pray and to not faint or quit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. There's a tendency when we don't get the answer to prayer we expect to allow a little disappointment to creep in. A little bitter bitterness. We begin to question God and sometimes we even cease to pray because God's not giving us what we ask for. Nothing could be more disastrous. God's answer and his timing is always perfect. And the answer that God has for us may be better than anything we could have ever dreamed of. We must seek to align ourselves and our will with God's will. And in doing so, we will receive the greatest blessings he has in store for us. You know, scientists have proven that there is power in prayer. There are over 100, well, 1,500 reputable medical studies when the mind of man meets the mind of God through the medium of prayer, something happens. Duke University professor Harold G. Koning, MD, said it this way, studies have shown prayer can prevent people from getting sick. And when they do get sick, prayer can help them get better faster. People are more, who are more religious and pray more have better mental and physical health. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ tells us in Matthew 5, 44, to pray for those who despitefully use and persecute you. This topic is a sermon all to itself. Are we praying for our enemies? You know, it's easy to pray for our loved ones, our friends, our family, our church members, but to pray for our enemies, particularly these days, as you watch TV or listen to the news, you can get the impression that everyone's your enemy. I mean, there's a, a it's, it's crazy out there. If I'm going to pray for my enemies, I'm going to need more time. If you watch or listen to the news, it seems that we have a lot of praying to do. Surely Christ doesn't expect this, does he? Some time ago, a dear friend of mine confided in me that he didn't like someone at church. Now, before you start looking around, this person and the person that he referred to to me are, are not here. They're not members here any longer. So don't look for these guys. As a matter of fact, there was very little positive that they could find in this individual. He found him abrasive, a little brash, somewhat pompous. But he was concerned for this person and decided that he would pray for this individual. And so my friend made it a point to pray. It was challenging at first, but he made it a point to pray faithfully every day. After a while, my friend began to see positive character traits in the person he was praying for. Eventually, the two became good friends. My friend concluded that God had changed his heart and made him more loving and forgiving. And that's how God works. We must pray for those we don't see eye to eye with, for their sake and for ours. Are we willing to pray until God reveals his will? Are we willing to submit our will to God's will and pray according to his will, thereby giving us the right answer to the right request? 
Unfortunately, the reason many people are not purposeful and persistent in their prayer lives is that they don't really know who God is and the role that he plays in their lives. They don't have an appreciation of how God has led them through their lives, of what he is doing right now at this very moment for them, of his intercessory work, and what of, of what he wants to do through them. I would challenge you to spend time this week in some deep Bible study. Spend sincere, focused time with God in prayer, one-on-one. -on -one. Be purposeful and set apart time. Time for prayer. If you can, set apart a half an hour a day, just you and God. If you're already setting time apart, increase it a little bit. Spend some time thinking about how God has led you to where you are. Think about the people he has put in your life and how he is putting them there so that you have an opportunity to draw them to him. Seek to find God's will for you as you ask according to his word, as you believe his promises, and as you continue to press your petitions with a determination that will not be denied. God has done great things for us as a church. Amen. This sanctuary that we are sitting in is an answer to prayer. Our church school is an answer to prayer. These things don't happen by accident. There are still greater things God wants to do through the Murfreesboro Church and through us as individuals. We must be ready to follow. God has always had a chosen people. And God holds these chosen people to a higher standard, as well he should. Our scripture reading from this morning, that ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As we draw closer to the end of time, God's people will have built a relationship with him that will take them through the time of trouble right to the end. This relationship will be built solidly on scripture and an active prayer life. My prayer this morning is that we take our prayer lives seriously that we each set apart time to spend in prayer, that we, like Enoch, pray without ceasing so that we are able to enter the promised land when Christ returns. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided us with, for the way that you have led in our lives, the blessings that we enjoy. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you in prayer. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be more intentional, more purposeful in our prayer lives. Lord, we want to be ready when you return. Help us, draw us closer to you, that we may be ready for that day. In your name we pray, amen. Please rise with me to sing 